Hi, everybody. Uh, it's my great joy and privilege to introduce this year's Life Achievement Award <laughs> recipient, Rita Moreno. I have been so in love with this woman for a long, long time, and we'll get into that. But uh, she's a great lady with an extraordinary history and, uh, and a talent that uh, endures now and uh, also is timeless, and we'll get into that too. But uh, Rita, I'm so glad that you're the recipient this year, and it's great to be able to chat with you this way. You're glad. <laughs> you should have seen my house when I got the word. Actually, I was in the car driving when you called. And you, you mentioned this, and, and I, I just I couldn't quite take it in. I said, let me call you back. Before I go off the road. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and, and now, now that we've got that over with, uh, what's this thing about in love? Hmm? I'm a dirty old lady. <laughs> in my well, heart of hearts. Before we get into your remarkable history, I, I will tell you one. Uh, we've, we've chatted uh, various times on sets. We've been involved, and we've never done a scene together, but we've been in some of the same project. But there was one time I remember, and it was in New York, and I think it was at Orso. I'm pretty sure that was. Probably, because I love Orso. And it was the late 80s, and I was in a Broadway show that was, that I couldn't wait. You know, if you're not really thrilled with what you're doing or with the show, you've you got to do it eight times a week. It's not like, so I was a little down with that. It's like a punishment. Yeah, and I was a little cynical about it, and I mentioned that. And you were so positive, fiercely positive. You just really were basically saying, now look, this is what you do. You can always find joy in doing some of this. This is what we love. This is what we do. And you really kind of lifted me up in a way that was easy for you. It was just your real positive outlook. And it was, it was, it kind of helped me. It was a great reminder. Well, that was nice of me. I did, did I really, I don't, re I remember seeing you there. I don't remember what the conversation it was about. It was just that, that, that incredibly positive approach that you've always had. You've always had that great sparkle. I want to go all the way back, if I may. Uh, you know, you, part of this is, of course, in, in your memoir. But uh, I always like hearing the, the earliest stuff. I know when you, were, when you were a little child in Puerto Rico, before you came to New York, and your mother, and just, just talk a bit about, you know, the beginnings of your love for performing and how that happened. The way. beginnings of my love for performance really uh, started in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to dance for Grandpa. I was uh, three, four, and five years old, and he put on a record, remember records? And uh, he said, Rosita, baila. And I would jump around the room and shake my little booty. I mean, we really are born with music in, in the Caribbean. And uh, it's no accident that we and, and the black community have rhythm. Remember that? the pejorious kind of phrase, which is no longer that. And um, I loved that. It just seemed to be the most natural thing in the world. I wasn't thinking then that I wanted to be a performer because I didn't even know what that was. I was too young. Right. But uh, when my mother decided to come to this country, that's when uh, a friend of hers said to me, saw me bopping around the apartment too in, in our ghetto apartment, and said, I think uh, Rosita has some dance talent. Let me take her to my dance teacher, who was a Spanish dance teacher. His name was Paco Cancino, who was uh, related uh, to uh, Margarita Cancino, who later on became Rita Hayworth. And um, he thought I had some talent, too. So that's, that's how it really started. I couldn't have been more than five, five and a half years old. That's when it all happened. I always wondered when you mentioned uh, the, the change coming to New York, that you oh, left a world of technicolor, I did. and now it was gray and dark in oh, New it York. Was, oh, it was, it was, the contrast was absolutely shocking. First of all, my mother was quite young when she had me, and um, she did something that you never did in Puerto Rico, a Catholic island. She divorced my father, who uh, was a, 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 unhappily a philanderer. And uh, she made a decision uh, on her own that uh, she wanted life to be better for her and for me. And she did something astonishingly brave after the divorce, which was pretty brave then. She left me with him and took a ship to this country, this country in that instance being New York City, USA. 
and not speaking a word of English. In a way, my story is really her story. She was so amazingly, amazingly brave. And she stayed with an aunt in a ghetto apartment, got a job sewing in a sweatshop because uh, for whatever reasons, a lot of Hispanic women and Caribbean women are wonderful at needlework and sewing. Mm -hmm. And she did that for a number of months until she had made enough money and um, learned enough English to take that ship back to Puerto Rico to retrieve me. And we came back on a ship called the SS Carabobo, which is a hilarious name in Puerto Rico because it, <laughs> it means stupid face. Stupid face. Not a good omen <laughs> to be on a ship called the SS Stupid Face. And we ran into a hideous storm at sea. So that what should have taken maybe a day and a half or maybe two days to get to New York Harbor took more like four days because of the storm. Do you remember it? Oh, I, I remember mean, it's clear because you're vividly. You're, you're, yeah. It's in the book. I remember vividly. And you know, the, the, we Puerto Ricans have many, many wonderful qualities, but one of the qualities that really makes us stand out is our, um, our gift for panic. <laughs> I mean, you never saw so many Puerto Ricos getting religion in your life when this thing started to bob up and down like a cork. And it was very, very scary. But uh, we finally got to New York Harbor. I saw this lady, this lady with oh, the yes, torch. Yes. And right. I asked my mother, I said, Mommy, ¿quién es esta mujer tan grande? And she told me about this lady who, um, who was inviting everyone to come live here and to be nurtured and taken care of and all that kind of stuff. And people who are homeless and poor and hungry. And I remember thinking at the time, I think we're overqualified. <laughs> I mean, we were really very, very poor. Yeah. But I remember that the lady to me was just killer because I thought she was holding a huge ice cream cone. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then I decided, oh my goodness, a lady runs this country. <laughs> a little prescient, but you know what? It seems to be coming, doesn't it? Anyway, the, the shock of this hideous weather, which was February. February in New York is brutal. I mean, the Ides of March are fast upon us also. And um, it was a shock. I couldn't understand why my mother said this was going to be a better life. I couldn't understand her reasoning, because I froze. And it was gray, it was all concrete. I remember seeing one cat. We were in the bus on the way to the um, ghetto in the Bronx to stay with my mother's aunt, Titi. And I remember seeing one cat who looked kind of ashy. And I couldn't understand, having just come from this green paradise, what had happened to the trees because there were no leaves on them. I had never seen a tree. Bleak. With no leaves. That's and I right. said, what happened to the trees? She said, oh, they'll come back. February in New York. Yeah. It's gray and she bleak. said, this is yeah. a thing called winter. So now you're, so you're a young girl. You, it, would it be fair to say that the dancing, and I assume you started singing just because you're, you... Just because uh, I did. <laughs> because you did. Yeah. Was that your outlet in a way that that was your, your area of, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but well, imagination? Well, I understood art. very quickly when I did my very first performance, which was at a Greenwich Village nightclub with my dance teacher, Paco Cancino, who was not a whole lot taller than I was. Mm -hmm. And he partnered me, partnered me in a Spanish dance, and we, we danced with the castanets. And when I saw the smiles on people's faces, so it wasn't just grandpa, and when I heard the applause, I thought, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I made a five-year-old decision that has never changed. I loved the attention. I still love the attention. And anybody who tells you otherwise is full of it. Well, it's your nature, and it comes through. It's it is It's part of what nature. makes you... All right, so now tell me about, I know some of this, but I like hearing it from you. The first significant job for you, the first professional job, or some of the things that happened in between. It could have been something in school. I just love these, you've already spoken to it, these uh, the kind of milestones, and, but the early ones, before anybody The very knows. early ones started uh, with bar mitzvahs. I don't know why bar mitzvahs, but there they were. I was being booked by my dancing in school New York. <laughs> in New York, and uh, I would go there and do my Carmen Miranda imitation. My mother made my costumes, 
and uh, I had the fruit salad hat, and the people thought I was adorable. And, uh, that and how old are you by now? 10, 11, oh, 12, gosh. something. I was about 10. Yeah, okay. And uh, actually, it started before then, I think eight or nine. Mm -hmm. And I would be getting money for it. We'd get $10, $15. That was pretty fabulous. And then after that, my first experience when I was 13, I did my first Broadway show. And uh, that I was in for some surprises in that one. I was 13, passing for 11, playing a nine year old, because I was always petite. And I never did look my age from the time I was a little kid. I was. And this younger. was in? Uh, you expect me, a date from me? I don't remember dates. No, no, no. Oh. The show. Oh, the show. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you're not looking for dates. Uh, this was in a show called Sky Drift, oh. which opened and closed overnight. But I played a little Italian girl. It was a, it's an interesting experience because I played a little Italian girl whose mother is according to the family, having hallucinations. In fact, it was a play call, uh, about three young men in World War II who have died and are coming back for one last visit with their families. We were the Italian family, and there was an American family, and there was an Irish family. And my mother is talking to the air, it seems, in, the, uh, in this scene, and it's very sad. And I saw a lot of people, this was a preview about three days before we opened. And I saw that the people were shifting in their seats a lot and coughing. And I got it, boy, I tell you, I miss showbiz because I thought, they're not happy. I don't know why, but they need something. <laughs> this is awful. They need something to distract them. So I took a spaghetti, some spaghetti from my plate, because it's an Italian family. And I started to suck up a long strand of spaghetti while my mother, in tears, is talking to my dead brother. But why are you not here anymore, darling? Aldo, I love you so much. I go, <laughs> sucking up a strand of spaghetti. And of course, people began to giggle, at least the ones in the front rows. Well, that went fine, I thought. The curtain comes down because there were three acts, three families. And the leading lady of that particular uh, act catches me in the wings, Lily Valente. I'll never forget her name. She was a wonderful character actress yeah. of that time. Uh, <laughs> took me by my scrawny little neck and shook me and said to me, if you ever, ever, ever do that again, I will hear about it no matter where I am, and I will find you, and I will kill you. <laughs> wow. So that's how I learned that you don't upstage people. You don't do things while they're doing their thing. It was a hard <laughs> lesson because I, I thought, well, gee, I thought I helped the scene. I really was ignorant. I didn't know about theater. I'd never seen a play. These plays, I really had so little theater experience simply because everything closed so quickly. But you're getting experience. Now you've I'm some. getting some. Oh. And I'm, I'm working with uh, you know, some wonderful actors, and I'm, I'm listening a great deal and, and, learn, and, uh, and absorbing as much as I can. Right. Didn't occur to me uh, to go to an acting class because I just don't think any Puerto Rican kid of that time knew there was such a thing. Really, um, but you were we dancing. Dance you were That's performing. different. You were you we still had dance performing. class, right. and I sang just because I liked to sing and I had a, a good voice. But acting class never even occurred to me. So whatever I did was instinctive, and as you see from my first experience, uh, very inexperienced. But um, I loved it. I loved what I was doing. I was doing radio a lot then. And uh, I did the Ave Maria Hour, a Catholic. <laughs> I love these stories. I'm glad you're asking me. I love the Ave Maria Hour because inevitably, at one point, I played Bernadette. Wow, oh, yes. Bernadette, who saw the visions oh, yes. in the grotto. Right. And um, I remember that particular uh, episode of the Ave Maria Hour where I have to say, 
But I tell you, I saw this lady in the grotto with the blue veil. They get that child out of here. She's mad as a hatter. <laughs> Don't you love that? I do, I do. I did an amateur hour. It wasn't Major Bowes, but I did amateur hours where I sang my Spanish songs and played my castanets. I was busy. Next part, next role. I'm uh -huh. look, I love the way this, you're right. taking this all in. Now you're a young teenager. You're now I'm in about 16, and I'm playing in a play with, you know, I think that was, Senior Chicago was that last play with the same leading man. Alfred Ryder. Yes. Who at this point, remember Alfred Ryder? Yeah, no. no kidding, wow. Well, I mean, I know who he was. Well, the little was. girl he, he uh, uh, saw in Skydrift and the young teenager he saw at 16 in Senior Chicago was a whole nother bag of stuff. Right. And he was very, very interested. He's just a dirty guy. He loved young women. Well. And what do you mean, well? Well, I'm, I'm sympathetic. <laughs> If it's you, I'm very sympathetic. Oh, okay. <laughs> and that's the one, you know, that closed practically overnight. The one after that, which took many years, was um, Elmer Gantry. Ah. And that's when I was in my, in my very early 20s, and I played Sister Sharon. Now, who played Elmer Gantry? I know this one. Robert Shaw. It's Robert Shaw. The English Shaw. actor. Ah, interesting. Who sure. was wonderful. He's a terrific actor. He was wonderful until, you know, he, was, he shocked everybody because he really had a singing voice. Right. And one too many people said to him, it's interesting how vulnerable and fragile we are, we right. actors. One too many people said to him, how do you do that? You've never taken a singing lesson in your life. Your pitch is wonderful. Your time is great. And that was his death knell. He began to sing badly. He began to lose his sense of rhythmic musical time. Started to think about it too much. Exactly. Because he probably went home and said, how do I do that? You know, that kind right. of thing. And he got, by the time we opened, he was, he, and he got nailed terribly by the critics for something that he had naturally. He was wonderful as Elmer Gantry. And I was a, I thought I was a swell uh, sister, Sharon. I'm sure you were. But uh, again, one night. That's the story of my life. I should call it the book One Night Only. You know who was like this? I remember him talking about it was uh, Jimmy Coco. Oh, one of my best friends. Well, you know, Jimmy Coco had been in, it seemed to me, the number was 17 Broadway shows, all of which one were night. Flo one night flops. <laughs> But he got so much experience, he always said, that when he was finally in a hit, uh -huh. he was really seasoned, you know. He, but I'm sure he, not only experienced, but I'm sure he also, uh, he also, I think he probably impressed people. He was yes. one of those very natural, funny people. Right. I mean, that man made me wet my knickers more than anybody So that I've even though met. it was a flop, people were going, yeah, but who's Jimmy Yeah, Cohen? but who's that kid? You sure know, who's so. that boy? Who's that man? And... So, but the one thing that really broke my heart is that for Elmer Gantry, my agent sent me a bottle of champagne. And the following day when the notices came out, we, they said, do not come back. And I said, well, I want to go to my, yeah, come get your stuff. And somebody stole my bottle of champagne. Oh. I never had a bottle of oh. champagne. It really broke my heart. All right, what's next? This the is next one is then... Um, Oh my gosh, then I did... You can uh, jump, you can just... Well, I, I did, I played, here's what was wonderful. This came after Hollywood, though. I played, um, I played uh, Annie Sullivan in The Miracle Worker. Oh, you did? Oh. But it was the first time I had been allowed right. to play someone who was not Hispanic. Was not Hispanic. But that was later. Uh, I was about, uh, I'm guessing about 20. This was after some of my earlier Hollywood days. I still hadn't done West Side Story or anything like that, no, no, nothing no. big. When was the first, let me just go back because I'm yeah. not sure. When's the first time that you made, that you went to Hollywood? I was 17. You were 17. I was 17 years old on the contract to MGM Studios. Right. Which was the studio of the dreams of any young person who sang and danced because it was the musical studio. Other, right. other studios made musicals, but none of them usually compared with MGM. MGM had Gene Kelly, Ann Miller, Judy Garland, Astaire, all of those And people. Elizabeth Taylor. 
So tell me about that, because I know you were part of that, right? I mean, you encouraged that, that you were the... Well, I tried, you know, I had no role Hispanic, models. Hispanic, earthy Elizabeth Taylor or whatever. You were. That's true. It's, yeah. that's, that's right. You got that from the book, right? Right. Yeah. Because but I think I knew it because of some of the pictures I'd seen before. Because you really did have that. There was one famous uh, Life magazine or one of the... Oh, the cover of Life. Yeah, the cover of Life. <laughs> but I made Elizabeth Taylor my role model because there weren't any. That's right. For young Hispanic people. Forget girl, boy, man, woman. It was nobody. Dolores Del Rio was before my time. Lupe Velez, those were the only two big Spanish stars, were before my time. So there was no one. So I needed to find someone that I wanted to emulate, and it turned out to be Elizabeth Taylor. And uh, indeed, some of the pictures kind of resemble her. I mean, she was a raving beauty. I was never a raving beauty. You I was get a to pretty know girl. it all because you're similar in a way. You're kind of straight shooter and say it like it is and all. Did was she like to... that? Yeah, I believe so. I, yeah. mean, I thought you might have known her a bit, but I think well, she was known for that. Well, I met her briefly uh, when I was at MGM and in a very humiliating way. Mm. I had dated uh, Nikki Hilton, her ex-husband at that point. Yeah. She had just recently divorced him like about four or five months. And I was in a screening room at MGM. She was there. They always held um, screenings for the young people just to, to make them familiar with acting and you know, to, to study all these right. great actors who worked at MGM. And she was there, and I had never been introduced to her, and I still wasn't. She said, you're Rita Moreno, aren't you? And I said, yes. <laughs> and she said, I understand you dated my ex-husband. <laughs> and I went, oh, shit. And uh, I said, yes. And she said, is it true he threw you into the pool? And I was an absolute misery. Number one, it wasn't true. And it made me feel very foolish. And that's what she wanted. Uh -huh. She was jealous. <laughs> yeah. Meow. And I'd never run into that before. Oh. I, it just, I really went home very hurt, so embarrassed. But I must tell you, she was devastatingly beautiful. Yeah. Oh my God, she was outrageous. Beautiful. I met Clark Gable. My first day at MGM. Hello, darling. <laughs> I met Clark Gable. I had already been assigned to a film called The Toast of New Orleans. What was your first film? Uh, my first film was an independent in New York. All right, your first under contract. Under contract was Toast of New Orleans. Toast of New Orleans. With a then very popular young tenor named Mario Lanza. Right. Who was big at the time. I've seen that. I, of course, I know this one, right? Yeah. Catherine and with, Grayson. Uh, and Catherine it's, Grayson. It's, it's one of the yeah. Joe Pasternak's endless uh, it's movies. It's fun, that movie, because she doesn't see it coming, and he's singing higher than she is. And she right, is right, right. Who is this guy? <laughs> yes. It's delightful. Oh, you remember I mean, that? I do remember. Oh, my gosh. So that was the first as a conference. That was my first, and I was thrilled beyond words. I spent every single day that I wasn't working on a film or in a scene on other sound stages, because now I could just go in. I could just I'd get all dressed up put on some cute little outfit and put on makeup and go to the studio and visit. And I would spend hours and hours, I had nothing else to do, right. visiting sets. The Humphrey Bogart set, the Clark Gable set. I go to MGM, the great musical studio of all time. I never got to sing, I never got to dance. <laughs> Not yet. I mean, well, no, excuse me, I did do a dance, a big dance in Toast of New Orleans, but after that I never got to sing or dance again, which is absolutely bizarre. Wow. Yeah. And what year, I'm trying to do the math in my head. It's oh, do it because I can't, I don't remember well, it's years. it's the early 50s. It's the late 50s. Yeah. It's yeah. early 50s, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so now what's the next? I mean, we don't have to all of them, but I kind know. of the build. Then after that comes Pagan Love Song, a remake right. of an old movie. Um, this time, though, with Esther Williams and uh, Ricardo Montalban in the lead, a brand new Latin lover. He had right. come from Mexico. And uh, this was a big deal at the time. He's a lovely man. Oh, I work with him. I and, liked him so much. You know, everyone always says, and a true gentleman. Yeah, he really was. Yes. Yeah, Rosita, how are you? Yes, that's right. Yes. Very cordial. Yes. yes. And uh, he came to visit me because I was the only other Latina in the entire place and probably in all of California as far as he knew. So when I was doing Toast of New Orleans, he came to visit me and I showed him my dance. And uh, we had a big fancy lift, and the boy lifted me up and turned me and 
fell on the floor with me, which was very, very embarrassing. Oh, God, I was so, I was in misery because I felt so proud of doing this dance. I was a Spanish dancer, remember? I'd right, never right. done this kind of MGM type dancing right, right. up till that time. So well, you, you have your SAG card. You're so I, oh, under I contract. had my SAG card before. From the independent from film. From the independent film, and I had done my very first time with a SAG card. Boy, it's like 60 years ago. I was doing an army training field film. Mm -hmm. I was a, an extra. Right. And uh, I was an extra on a beach in a bathing suit. I don't remember what it was about because nobody told us. We were just extras, but I got my card. You got your card. Yeah. Sixty right. years. Can you, I think it's sixty-six, something like that. All right. So now, all right. Next film. I just want to. So now the next film is uh, uh, what did I say it was? The uh, the remake of uh, a pagan uh, pagan love song. Pagan love song. And that was with Renan. No, not Renan Wallace. That was with, uh, with uh, Howard, Howard Keel. Oh right, it was right, a right. Musical. Right, right, right. And uh, Howard. That was Howard's first film, with right. that beautiful voice with of his, that baritone. And I played, and then it started to hit me. I started to play these little dark-skinned girls where they would darken my skin and put black wigs on me right. and little sarongs and barefoot and all that kind of stuff. And suddenly, I wasn't wearing shoes too often anymore, right. Right. which was so disconcerting. Right. And from there, I went to um, interesting, oh, Latin Lovers. That was the film that Ricardo was doing as his very first film with Lana Turner. Mm -hmm. And I had a swell experience on that. I played his girlfriend until he meets Lana. And I get very jealous and all that kind of stuff. I didn't have a great deal to do. And one day on the set, the assistant director calls me over, and I was still Rosita. He said, Rosita, can you do me a favor for Miss Turner? I said, oh, of course. And he said, go to the wardrobe department. She forgot she left something there. And bring it back and bring it to her dressing room. I said, OK. And I go to the wardrobe department, and uh, the wardrobe woman, with a very stern look on her face, hands me a little pouch. And she says, take this directly to Miss Turner's dressing room and do not open it. She sounds a little bit like Lupe Velez, this woman. <laughs> well, I had a look and see what was in of there. Of course you did, of course. It was a padded bra, and I was so thrilled. Uh -huh. I was thrilled because I thought, oh, well, she's like the rest of us. I mean, they had me padded so much, I bumped into the wall once and ricocheted. I mean, really, a lot of Goodyear rubber there. And um, had a wonderful time on that, but very little to do also. Right. Always going to other sets. I visited the Judy Garland set of Summer Stock like right. every day right. just to be there. And then, to my absolute amazement, Gene Kelly uh, asked for me to do a small role in Singing in the Rain, right. a musical comedy. And a girl named Jean Hagen, who knew? A new young girl who was one of my cohorts, Debbie Reynolds. And, uh, but he gave me the part of an American girl, Zelda Zander. And uh, he wanted me to cut my hair. He mm -hmm. wanted me actually to wear the hairdo that Sid Charisse wore in that fabulous musical number at the end. Right. That Slaughter on 10th Avenue type number. Right, right. At Colleen that Moore, yep. Gish. But I said, oh, I, I can't cut my hair. And he said, excuse me, <laughs> what is your name again? He was so astounded that he said, OK. So he put a red wig on me. And that's Zelda Zander. And that is the last film I did for MGM. And then I was dropped, which was the end of my life, I thought. Daddy didn't want me anymore. You know, that was a, well, very, yeah, that was I, a very patriarchal studio, oh, sure. Mr. Mayor. And then? Then there followed, uh, aside from many, many tears and heartbreaks, I didn't tell my mother for weeks. I just kept going to the studio every day and telling her I was no. visiting. I just didn't, I couldn't tell her. And um, finally I told her, of course. And then I started to do some television. And after that I began to do some regional theater, some summer theater, summer stock. 
And that's how it went for quite some time until I ended up with an, uh, another contract at 20th Century Fox. Right. Based on not, ha not having anything to do with my talent, but a 1954 Life magazine cover. Show business is so bizarre. Right. Uh, Daryl Zanuck saw me on the cover of this magazine, and he said, who is that? Does she speak English? Get that girl. I mean, <laughs> who says things like that? Well, you're gorgeous, but anyway, go ahead, you know. So that's what happened. Not to forget that, you know, talent aside, there is that, you know, but... So well, then you did... I ended up under contract to MGM. And I did, uh, I, I mean, no. 20th Century 20th Fox. 20th Century Fox. And there I did just a few films. I did um, The Lieutenant Wore Skirts with mm. Sherry North. Right. Sherry at the time was Fox's answer to Marilyn Monroe. Right. They were trying to find another blonde. Yeah. And uh, Sherry was a dancer. She came from Broadway. Mm -hmm. And she kind of, sort of, sang. So they put her in this uh, film with, um, oh, who was the, who's the leading man? In, he was so wonderful, that sad-faced, clown-looking man who was in... Uh, the Marilyn Monroe movie, The Girl Upstairs, what was that? Tom Ewell. Tom Ewell. Seven Year Itch. Seven Year Itch. So when I was given a role in that movie, I was doing a pastiche of her walk down the steps mm -hmm. with Tom, which was supposed to be, you know, kind of an inside joke, and everybody was supposed to say, oh, I know what she's doing. She's supposed to be Monroe upstairs. And it worked. It was very funny. Good. And... Um, but the funniest part of that was going to Natasha Lightez, Marilyn Monroe's acting coach at Fox. She was famous mm -hmm. as Marilyn Monroe's acting coach, who was always interfering with people. Right. And people uh, that she was working with kept her at way at arm's distance. So this is before Paula Strasberg. Did she already had this? She had before going to New York and oh, oh this is yep. Strasberg came way later. Way later, but she had already she the had person Natasha that was Natasha Lightest is a Russian woman, uh -huh. and I thought, and she became very famous as Monroe's coach, and intensely disliked by anyone on the set because she was always interfering, and changing Monroe's performance. So they really kept her way at the other. You are not allowed, you know, on the set. <laughs> so she had a marvelous thing that she did with Monroe to tell her that she wanted more sex into the scene, into her attitude. Uh, she would point to her crotch, and Marilyn was always watching her, and she'd go like this. <laughs> I don't see anything. Come on, deliver. That's what she did. And I, thinking, well, she's her coach. I'm going to go to her and have her help me with this role, which is supposed to be Marilyn. I don't even know where you can use some of this, but uh, you'll enjoy it anyway. I'm enjoying it. We'll figure you'll out what we can it. use. Okay, so she says to me, she said, let me see you do the scene. So I come down the steps, and there's no steps, so I'm you know, simulating steps, and I'm trying to be as sexy as I can. And I start to say my first line. She says, no, 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 no. I don't see anything. You have to be sexual. You're going to do Marilyn, you have to do it more sexual. Let's do it again. And I come down these pretend steps. And she says, no, no, no. She said, look, pretend that you are holding a rose, a long stem rose between your legs. <laughs> In your vagina. Yeah, vagina. Oh, okay. Yes. And I, I can tell you that my, my hairline went back about an inch when that word, the W word, came up. And she said, Now do it. And I did. And it was very Monroe ish. It was weird. <laughs> the key. It's like, ooh. Funny, funny.